Dear Heavenly Father, we just continue to come into your presence this morning with praise and worship in our hearts and on our lips, Lord. We thank you for this special moment in time that we can freely come into this house and worship you, Father. We prepare our hearts to hear your word this morning, Father. For when we hear your words, it is everything that we need, Father. I submit myself now to your anointing, Father, and I refuse to do this without you, Lord. I love you, Father. And I thank you and I praise you. And we continue on in this service, Father God, receiving your word and putting action to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. I want to welcome everyone again to the Freedom Center. It's glad to have everyone here this morning. I'd like to start out um, in the book of Joel, if you'll turn with me, um, to Joel. I don't minister a lot out of Joel, but... And we're going to turn to chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses um, 25 and 26 this morning. You know, I'm here to tell you this morning that God is a restorer, and this is our year as His children. This is our day as His children. Amen? So we're looking at Joel chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And we shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dwelt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Amen? Amen. He is the God that restores. Hallelujah. You know, we need to get determined in our hearts today that we're not going to settle for just expecting life as it is right now. We don't need to expect life as it is right now. And we definitely don't need to accept it for what it is right now. As normal. Amen? I'm here to declare that we as His children are not going to be passive anymore. Amen. That we are taking our lives back. We have the anointing. Pastor Lyndon mentioned or preached on it last week. If you didn't hear it, please um, go online and listen to it. We're taking our relationships back because God's restoring it. We're taking our homes back in the name of Jesus. We're taking our finances back. We're taking our jobs back. We're taking our peace back in the name of Jesus. We're taking wholeness back. Hallelujah. We're taking our health back in the name of Jesus. Our hope back. Our love back. Hallelujah. We are not going to let stuff be stolen from, from, stolen from us anymore. There's been stuff being stolen from us. We just sang about the promises of God and how they never fail. We have those promises, hallelujah. We just got somebody trying to rob them from us. We're taking our present back. And we're taking our future back, hallelujah. And we're going to let God, our almighty God, restore the destruction of our past. And only He can do that. And He will do it completely. As a matter of fact, He already has. Amen? We're not going um, to let Satan rip us off anymore. You know, He's been ripping us off as Christians. And we've given Him a free highway into our lives sometimes. I remember when I'd play sports, sometimes I'd hear people say, well, they just stole your lunch money right out of your pocket. And you know, um, that's what the enemy's been doing to us. Because we lay down sometimes and we don't play defense. Defense is your word of God. It's your whole armor of God. It's perfect and it will work for you. But we're not going to let him keep ripping us off, hallelujah. And in a minute we're going to look at Joshua chapter 5. But first I want to remind you 
that the children of Israel, remember they went from Egypt to the wilderness and then to the promised land, if you read about it. And they were in the, in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years. And they were not fruitful and they were not walking in abundance. Now when they came out from the Egyptians, they had everything that they needed. Yes, they did. But then on down the road a little bit, disobedience came in. And then they were in the wilderness because of their lack of obedience. And then they were finding themselves in a land that was not fruitful and was not full of abundance. And they were walking in what, uh, they were not walking in what God called as prosperous times. They were barely making it from day to day. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I've been there. Barely making it from day to day. Whether it's financially, physically, emotionally. In fact, God, you know, He is so merciful and full of love. And this is in the Old Covenant. He, ran, he rained down manna from heaven every day for them to eat. Because they didn't have a harvest, you see. They didn't have a harvest to eat. And then the reason is because there was no good land in the wilderness for them to plant seed into. Okay? So they couldn't get the crops to grow. And actually, God didn't want them camped out forever in the wilderness. He was trying to get them to the promised land. So God wanted to get them out of the wilderness into the promised land But in the wilderness, you know what? There was testing. Read about it. Go home and read about it. There was testing. There was trials. There was temptation. It was tough. It was hard. It was difficult. It was dark time for them. It was dry. A land of famine, a land of thorns, according to the word. Not an abundant land. A land of trouble and trial. And God, even through all this, He would miraculously rain down manna from heaven every day, restoring them. Even through their disobedience. And they would eat it. And then, of course, after a while, they got tired of eating it, right? Remember? And they start complaining. They started getting tired and sick and tired of where they were and raining, and God raining down manna for them to eat. And they started complaining. And then they got tired of the mediocrity of barely getting by. This is what was happening. You know, we need to get tired of barely getting by. Especially when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ paid the price for us to live an abundant, victorious life. We need to get tired of the coronavirus being in our country and in and amongst our homes and our schools and our families. It is trespassing on the children of God and it does not belong here in Jesus' name. And it must leave in the name of Jesus and by His blood. So they got tired of the mediocrity of barely getting by. And we do too. We need to get tired of that. Sick and tired of that. But you know what? God never intended, like I said earlier, for them to live in the wilderness. You know, it's one, time, it's one thing to go on a vacation And it's one thing to go camping and camp out. But God never intended for His people to live there, to take up residence there. A lot of us are taking up residence in places that we don't need to be. It took them 40 years because of their disobedience to make an 11-day trip. 40 years. An 11-day journey from the edge of Egypt to the Promised Land. And 40 years later, we come to this passage in Joshua chapter 5. Joshua 5, and we're going to read verses 11 and 12. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Hallelujah. So the manna runs out 
I mean, they don't need it at that time anymore. The manna runs out, time runs out, money runs out, peace runs out, patience runs out. Their patience ran out, their food ran out, their supply ran out. God said, I'm not going to leave you in this land of running out. He never intended it. He said, I'm going to bring you to a land running over. Running over. And he brings them to this land. And in verse 12 it says, from this point forward, you're going to live a different way. But they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. They ate fruit of the land of Canaan. And what this means, this was fruit of the land of of the promised land. That's what it means. It's a promise. Are we eating the promised fruit that he's given us? Do we even know what his promises are so we can walk in them? They started eating the fruit of God's promises that year. And I shared this verse with you this morning because I believe that this is that year for us. God's children, hallelujah. It's His time. This is the land where we as Christians no longer live in the land of the wilderness. We live in the promised land. We do because of the blood of Jesus Christ and only because of His blood. Most Christians don't even realize that. We live in the abundance of God beginning now, right now. This is your year. This is our year. This is the year of the church. Hallelujah. And we will not be a Laodicea church here in Jesus' name. Amen? But that starts with us individually. Your year to no longer live in barely getting by. This is the time for us to make a decision that we will enter into the promises of God, His promises, and we need to make the decision that we are not going to let anybody talk us out of that. In Jesus' name, I don't care if it's CNN, Fox News, doctor, lawyer, preacher, I don't care who it is, don't let them talk you out of the promises of God. And if you're a child of God, every promise in that book belongs to you. We just need to learn how to walk in it. Hallelujah. We were learning last week that we have the anointing. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We need to make that decision. You know, let's go to Esther. Chapter 9, I encourage you to read about Esther. It's a beautiful story, a strong story. Esther 9, 1 says, Now in the twelfth month, that is the month Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary, that the Jews had rule over them that hated them. Hallelujah. We are talking about God, our restorer. Hallelujah. See, in this story, if you read about it, Haman, under the king, he was very, very jealous of the Jews. He was jealous of God's people. If you have jealousy in it, in you, let God burn it out of you. Ask Him to deliver you from that because it will take you down horrible roads and steal and rob from you. But Haman was jealous and he wanted to destroy all the Jews because they didn't want to bow down to him. See, they didn't want to listen to him and he was the second in command. So he wanted to exterminate all the Jews and of course this was not the first or the last time that the devil tried to exterminate the Jewish people, God's people. But there had been a written decree that went out to kill all of God's people, the Jewish people, and they were going to be exterminated here in Esther um, chapter 9, if you read about it. And then we look at what happens in verse 1, 
in the very day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, and then in that very day where you are sitting right now, whatever is troubling your mind, whatever you are facing in your life, whatever obstacle or mountain that it is, I say to you in that very day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over over them, it was turned around to the contrary. Bam! That very day. And that can happen for you and me. The very day that they were going to be exterminated, the very day that they were all going to be killed. This is a true story. And the very day that the evil empire was going to kill all the Jews, it was turned to the contrary. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In other words, for, for years, they faced defeat. For years, they faced slavery, bondage. For years, frustration, suffering. And in one day, one day, God turned it all around. He turned around the years of defeat, the years of failure, the years of fr frustration, the years in the wilderness, the years of sickness and disease, hallelujah. Hallelujah the years of famine and lack, and in one day he turned it all around. And then they had dominion over their enemy. In that one day, instead of the enemy having dominion, dominion over them, that day is today for the child of God, for the body of Christ. That one day when Jesus hung on the cross and shed his blood, hallelujah, and then said, it is written, forgive them, Father, they know what, what they do. And he gave up the spirit. He descended into hell. And when he was in hell, we forget about what happened there. He opened a can of whoop on the devil, let me tell you. That we don't... I mean, I'd go on with that. But, and he, it, he made a show of him and his demonic forces openly. Hallelujah. And then he rose from the grave. He ascended on the third day and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's given us the Holy Spirit, the anointing. He's given us the power. Hallelujah. This is our day, hallelujah. This is His day, hallelujah, for us to walk in that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. In one day, God turned everything around to the contrary for their favor. What are you facing today that needs to be turned around for your favor? He is the God who restores. This is that day. Now you can listen to this whether you're here or um, maybe online, and you can say, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Pastor. I don't know if that could happen this year. I don't know if that could happen this day. I mean, look what we're facing. We're facing a, a worldwide pandemic. We're facing horrific things politically and things that are trying to come through the church, to, to the church, to destroy the church. Um, we're facing sickness in our home. We're facing financial devastation because of loss of jobs and just everything else. That po Gas prices are going up. It, I don't know that that can be this year. What dream has God planted in your heart? Because when He plants that dream, He will fulfill it and He will give you everything that you need and then some, hallelujah, to get done what He's called you to do. I have to declare to you this day that this is that time. This is that year. This is that day. This is your time as children of God. And it is all because of the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to repeat this after me. This is my time. This is God's time. This is the church's time. Amen. Hallelujah. And we believe that in Jesus' name. I want you to understand that whatever God did for someone else in Scripture, in the Bible, He's obligated to also do it for you. He healed me. He's obligated to heal you. And the reason, you can look it up later in Romans 2.11, is because He's no respecter of persons. Thank God. If He brings victory to one person, He has to be willing to bring it to all. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, if God did it for them, He'll do it for you. 
He'll do it for us. This is the day. This is the day for God to restore what the thief has stolen from you. And when I mention those words, something in your brain enlists that something's been stolen from you. Might be many things. John 10.10, let's let's look at this scripture. The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. See, so the devil will steal, kill, and destroy if we allow him to. If we allow him to. But not only has he, the enemy, tried to come and take what belongs to you, rightfully, as a child of God, but he's, he also inspires people. He inspires people. He'll inspire you to make a bad decision. He'll inspire you to be bitter. He'll inspire you to hang on to unforgiveness. He whispers in our ears to make bad choices, to hold on to unforgiveness toward others. He whispers in our ears to hold back from God and not sow into God's kingdom. Oh, you don't really want to do that. Oh, come on, come on now. You really think you can do that? He screams at you to be disobedient against the Word of God. He whispers in your ears to do things that... And this is why. He whispers in your ears to do things that will perpetuate Him being able to steal from you and rob from you. And so it's not also it's not just Satan sometimes. It's our own bad decisions that we use our own mind for. Okay? And our bad choices are not guarded and guided by the Word of God. When you make decisions, decisions that are not guided, 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 yes, by His words, you're going to have things stolen from you. And you're going to lose in life. We are supposed to be winners. He set us up to win. Every battle belongs to Him. You win in life when you live by God's principles. Right? And it's not that God makes all these rules and regulations and hoops to jump from and into and around. He doesn't do that to make you holy. It's that God has put principles in place and He knows that if we will work, He knows they'll work and if we'll walk in them and we'll follow those principles, um, that it also keeps Him from not being a respecter of men. Okay? It's not about do's and don'ts. It's about here are the things that will work for you, my children. He is all-knowing. These things will work for you if you apply them in your life. So follow the system that God set up because it works. Okay? We are talking about restoration. He is the God that restores. Here's another point. You've got to realize that if this was their year, okay, that we're talking about, This is your year. If this was their day, this is your day. If this was their time, this is your time. And I want you to face your tomorrow. God wants us to face our tomorrows and say, when we wake up, this is the day of the Lord. This is my time. This is my day. Hallelujah. (coughs) We need to say, this is my time. I want us to realize, too, you know, that the number one reason why Christians fail in life is because they have the wrong concept of God. They have the wrong concept of God and who He is. You know, most Christians 
They don't know who he really is. They don't know what his nature is like. And for most people you can ask, uh, especially Christians or Americans, they'll say, I believe in God. They believe he is the God. But when asked, they don't follow up or they don't say or don't allow him to be their God. And people, if God's going to turn stuff around for us, if we're going to see God restore some things in our lives that are so desperately needed, if we're going to see this restoration happen, God's got to be more than the God to you. He's got to be your God. Your God. It's got to be personal. He's got to be more than just the God, a God. He's got to be your God. He's got to be your Lord. God's already made Jesus Lord. That's not going to change. That's fact. That's truth. Hallelujah. But it's up to us. Is He going to be our Lord? Is He your Lord? He's already named by God the Lord of Lords, a big Big L, Lord. The King of Kings. Amen. Are we going to let Him be our God? Personal. I like what David said. And I love Psalms 91. Psalms 91, let's look at it, verses 1 and 2. He says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Hallelujah. See how personally made it? You're not, He was saying, you're not just the God of Israel. You're not just the God of Abraham. You're not just the God of my forefathers. You're not just the God of my parents or my grandparents and not just the God of my pastors or the leaders of the church. You are my God, is what David was saying. You've got to get personal with God. That's what He wants. This is your year, but He's got to be your God too. You see, He can't just be a, um, a distant relative to you. He can't just be, in which He is, but just way in heaven, Father. He can't just be... The, the guy out there, or the man upstairs. He's got to be your God. Your God. Your Lord. He's got to be the one that you cling to without ceasing. The one you talk to. The one you listen to. The one you cry to. The one you give to. The one you receive from. The one you worship. He's got to be the one you praise. The the one we think about when we wake up in the morning. Him. When we lay our heads down at night. Him. Thinking about Him, He has to be the one that we think about through tough times. And through good times. He's got to be the one we smile about. If you know his nature, you will be smiling about him. The one you cry to, the one you tell your troubles to. He's got to be the one that you hear his wisdom. He's got to be the one and the only one that you give your entire life and being to as a living sacrifice unto him. He's got to be the one that's the Lord of your life. And we make a lot of things, Lord. We have a lot of gods in our life, whether we realize it or not. He's got to be your God. If He's going to turn around your situation, if you're going to see His restoration show up in your life, He's got to be more than the God. He's got to be your God. Amen? Everybody say this. This is my time. 
This is my God. This is my Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's got to be personal. You know, um, when you watch a movie, good guy, bad guy kind of movie with heroes and and something happens in the movie and they steal the hero's wife or something that is special to him or a family member, and then they walk up and they, you hear them say, you just made that personal. There's a different tone to it, right? This just became personal. You know, whenever you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you begin to receive from the Lord and you begin to learn about His promises, and then the enemy comes in, tries to steal the word like he does, as it says he will. And sometimes we, we fall and we let the enemy come in and, and be a thief and rob from us. You know what God says? This is personal. That's my child. You just made it personal. That's my child. Satan has made it personal. He's entered into your vault, our vault. He's learned the combination. He has the access code. He has the password to your computer. He's figured out the safety lock on your telephone. Better than I have most of the time. <laughs> He's stealing us blind. This is personal now. Amen? This is personal, and I am getting my stuff back in Jesus' name. Because I'm a child of the living God. That's where you need to be in faith. I'm a child of the living God. I'm getting my stuff back. This is my time. This is about glorifying my God, my Lord. This is my God. This is the God of the Bible, my God. The God of the resurrection, my God. The God of the new covenant, my God. The God who keeps His promises, my God. The God who, who never fails and won't fail me, my God. The one who will never leave me or forsake me. The one that can raise the dead, my God. The one that can open the eyes of the blind, that's my God. The one that can turn water into wine. That's my God. The one that can walk on water. My God, your God. The one, the one that can turn every situation around and restore it. That's my God and that's your God. And I want to tell you something about him. If you look it up about restoration in the Bible, he repays what the devil has stolen. He's my God. He restores the lost that's my God. He opens my eyes and my ears and He gives me a reason to sing. That's my God. This God saw me in the pit of destruction and pulled me out of the pit of destruction. This is my God. He healed my body when it was trying to be destroyed. He restored me. Hallelujah. That's my God. I don't know what it is to you and what He is to you, but I know He's mine. I belong to Him. I am His and He is mine. It's personal. I don't know if you're grateful that He's delivered you and set you free, but I certainly am. And getting freer every day, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm thanking Him for it. He has restored you and made all things new. See, this has already occurred. We just got to grab hold of it. You became a new creature in Christ Jesus the day you accepted Him as your Lord and Savior. Bam! Restoration. Woo! Saying, hey, okay, guess what, honey? This is, this is my interpretation. Donna, guess what? I love you. You received me. You believe that I raised Jesus from the dead. You are mine now. You are the righteousness of me. And guess what? Everything in this Bible, honey, belongs to you now. Every promise in here belongs to you now. But you know we've got to find out what it is before we can walk in it, right? 
Because the enemy will strip that away from you too if you let him. Thank you, Jesus. You know, my God, you're my Savior, hallelujah. You're my reason to live, my reason to celebrate. You're not just the King of kings. You're my King of kings, hallelujah. You're not just the Prince of Peace. You're my Prince of Peace. You're not just the wonderful counselor. You're my wonderful counselor. You're not just the mighty God. You're our mighty God. Hallelujah. You're not just the mighty God with us. You are my mighty God with us. Hallelujah. There's something to say about when you make it personal. And you believe that He is as real to you as He is to anybody else. He is your God. He's not just the God of the multitudes. He's not just the God of the nations. He's not just the God of the people. He is the God of a person. You. He's he's all that and more. And there's something that you've got to understand about your God. You've got to know what He's like. To, to receive promises from Him, to receive healing from Him, to receive His restoration, you've got to know what His true nature is. What is His nature? I mentioned earlier that the first reason why people have a problem with Christianity and the first reason why some people don't become Christians is because they have a wrong concept of God. They have a wrong concept. They think He's mad at them. They think that He's a God of wrath. God's not mad at you. If you're His child, He is not mad at you. He is crazy about you. He is so in love with you. He's wild about you. He don't want to spend eternity without you. And you know what? He loves you and He wants to spend the rest of His life with you. And guess what? That's forever. That's forever. That's that's who God is. He's not mad. He's not mad at you. People have the wrong concept of God. And it's our responsibility to show them differently. They they don't want to follow a God that's mad at them. They don't want to say, you can be restored by this heavenly Father if they think He's a God that is angry with them, that's going to release wrath on them. They don't want to follow a God who's full of wrath, who's full of angry, mad, hate. The God of wrath is not the God we serve right now. He ha- And the reason I say that, hear me, is because He poured out His wrath on Jesus Christ Himself on the cross that day. Hallelujah. All of His wrath. And Jesus took that wrath on the cross. He took it into Himself and He buried it and He left it to die. He took your and my wrath that we deserve. He took God's wrath and He absorbed all of it in His body that day. Because of His great love for you and me, that's His nature. The only people, listen to me, that will face any wrath are the people who reject Jesus Christ. And He is not an unmerciful God but He will give people chance and chance and chance. Just how many people sitting in here, you don't have to raise your hand, how many of us did He give chance after chance after chance till we finally bent our heart, our lives, and our needs to Him as our Lord? Time and time again. How many times was He patient with you or me? That's His nature. How many times did He wait for you? and continue to extend His mercy and His loving kindness to you. we got to understand what kind of God He is. And if you understand that, you'll allow Him to restore you. You'll, You'll reach out and grab all His promises. This is your time. This is your year. This is God's time. This is His nature. His nature is dot, 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 good. His nature is good. He is a good father that we sang about earlier today. 
And no good thing does he withhold from the righteous, which is me and you if we receive him as our Lord and Savior. He is good. He is not a God of wrath. His wrath and anger endured for a night, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. Hallelujah. His wrath lasted for that night when Jesus hung on the cross and the sky turned dark at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and it thundered and it lightened and it was the eclipse of the physical sun, S-U-N, and the eclipse of God's sun at that time. And darkness covered the earth and the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus and the wrath of judgment fell upon the Lamb of God so, so that His mercy, His goodness, His kindness, His advantage, His favor would fall on you and me and all those who accept Him as Lord and Savior. That's why we can say, this is my time. And if we get this, if we get this is my time, I have the favor of God. He is restoring all things, hallelujah, to me. Then can you see how our churches can be restored and our country can be restored? Say again, this is my time. This is my God. And this is His nature. He is good. Amen. He is good. He wants to restore you to, to what was lost, what's been lost. And the thing about God's nature that I want, really want to get to you today is that God's idea is to always give back more. He always, if you read and He restores, He always gives back more than was taken. If you look and you study the Scriptures, you see a pattern with this. He always gives back more than what was taken. I want you to believe this about your God. God's nature is good and He always gives back more. He always gives back more. You can see it in Proverbs 6.31. Go home and read it. If the thief steals from you and is found, then he must repay sevenfold. What the enemy has stolen from you must return to you sevenfold. You gotta first know what's he stole from me. We see it in scripture with Job, and when Job lost everything, God restored Job's life and his fortunes, and he gave him back double. Read it, Job 42. And in Zechariah 10, God will restore double to us. There are places where he restores double and sevenfold. Exodus 22.1, you can see a pattern that God is setting up that he always wants to restore people more than what was taken. More. A while ago when I said, you've got things in your mind that you're thinking about? He wants to restore that more, double at least, or sevenfold. That ought to excite you today. That excites me, Hallelujah. This is His nature. He is good. This is God's way. If, th if something's been stolen from you, God doesn't just want you to get it back. He wants you to get it back and more. He wants you, oh, okay, He wants you to get it back with interest. We know what that is, don't we? Okay. It's time for you to experience the God of restoration in your life. God is ready to restore your health He's ready to restore your finances, your peace. He is the restorer. He restores all things, hallelujah, according to His Word. We all have lost hopes and dreams. We've all lost opportunities. We've lost years of time, but God is ready to restore it in your life. Reach out and receive it. He prayed he paid the ultimate price on Calvary, on the cross, for us to all be restored. He has promised restoration. And you must, we must get our minds and our hearts filled with this thought and this concept that God is the restorer. And then turn around God and say, God is my restorer. Hallelujah. 
And in closing, I believe today's message is a prophetic word for you today and for me. That this is your year. That this is your day. This is God's time through us to walk in the promises of God and be completely restored. The restoration of all things that have been lost or stolen from you. We don't need to live in the wilderness or let the thief continue to steal from us. We need to walk in the full, the full knowledge of God's love and know that we are His children and receive the complete package of restoration, which includes healing, which include, it includes all the promises of God. He is the God of restoration. He is your God of restoration. He is my God of restoration. He is our God of restoration. Amen? Amen. Let us stand to our feet and pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just continue to enter into your presence this morning. We thank you, Father God, for your presence here. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you that you did it all. It is finished, and we thank you, Lord. Open our minds, Holy Spirit, and our hearts for more of a hunger for your word, to dive deeper into your word, that we can find your promises, hold on to your promises, Lord, and that we can share you, who you really are, Lord, the goodness, the mercy, the love, the healing, the prosperity, the full package deal, God, who you really are to people who are in need of you as their, their Lord and Savior. They're looking, Lord. We know they're looking. They desire you as their God. Help us, Father God, by the power of your Holy Spirit and the anointing that is in us and that we carry that we will shine you and only you and your light to the world, God, in Jesus' name. Help us, Father God. Help us. We are asking for your help by the power of your Holy Spirit to strengthen us, guide us, restore it all back to us in Jesus' name and by his blood. And we thank you, God, that we will be good stewards over that restoration because your Holy Spirit will help us and guide us in that area too. Father God, I pray, pray a blessing over all of those that are here today. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Father God, that you are their God, that you are my God, that you are our God, that you are our Lord. And we reach out and we receive your promises now in the name of Jesus and we praise you for restoring all things in Jesus' name, in our lives and in our families and in this county and in our nation and in our world, Lord. But it starts with us, Father. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. And Father, if there's anyone that hears this message that has not received you as their Lord and Savior, then I ask you, Father God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and I know you're drawing them, that they repeat after me, and those who are here can repeat after me in affirmation. Father God, I receive you as my God, as my Lord and Savior. I believe you raised Jesus from the dead. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I receive you into my heart, and I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and Savior. Holy Spirit, Come inside and dwell. Lead me. Guide me into all truth. And comfort me. In Jesus' name. Amen.